Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to introduce Unit 2 of the course on numerical linear algebra. We'll provide a few motivating examples, introduce some key linear algebra concepts, and provide an overview of some of the topics that we'll cover in this unit. Almost everything in scientific computing involves numerical linear algebra and we can often reformulate problems in terms of solving linear systems of the form ax equal b. And we've already seen a number of examples of this throughout the course. In the data fitting unit, we found that we could reformulate polynomial interpolation in terms of solving van der Mond matrix systems. And when we looked at linear least squares, we found that the normal equations naturally arose that we could again solve using matrix algebra. Even when we look at nonlinear problems, we find that numerical linear algebra is still important. And when we looked at nonlinear least squares problems, we found that the Gauss Newton and Leverberg Marquardt algorithms could solve these problems by approximating them in terms of a sequence of linear systems to solve. And we'll see these themes arise throughout the rest of the course. All of the remaining units on numerical calculus, optimization, and eigenvalue problems will all touch on numerical linear algebra. So, in this unit, our goals are to first review some of the key linear algebra concepts that arise in scientific computing. We'll then look at algorithms for solving matrix problems of the form AX equal B in a stable and efficient manner. And we'll also look at various useful factorizations of matrices, such as the LU factorization and the QR factorization. But to begin, let's take a look at a few practical situations where matrix systems naturally arise in the modeling of physical systems. So our first example is taken from electric circuits. And here, we can make use of two fundamental laws. Firstly, Ohm's law tells us that if we have a resistor with resistance R and current I flowing through it, then the voltage drop across that resistor is given by V equal IR. Kirchhoff's law tells us that the net voltage drop around any closed loop is zero. And suppose we now take a look at this circuit shown here. We've got two batteries, V1 and V2, and six resistors. And if we wanted to find the current flowing through this circuit, then we could break it down into three components flowing around the three loops. So we could have I1 flowing around loop one, I2 flowing around loop two, and I3 flowing around loop three. And we would then say that the current in this network is given by the combination of all three of these loop currents. So now let's take a look at loop one. So if we look at R1, then we'll just have I1 flowing through it. If we look at R3, then we'll have both I1 and I2 flowing through it because that resistor is also in loop two. And if we look at R4, then we'll have I1 plus I3 flowing through it. And that then allows us to write down a linear equation, R1 times I1 plus R3 times I1 plus I2 plus R4 times I1 plus I3. And that should be equal to V1. And if we do that for the other two loops, then we end up with a matrix system to solve for the three currents I1, I2, and I3. And if we solve this linear system, then we can determine the entire current flowing through the network. And while this is a simple example, circuit simulator software can actually allow us to scale this up to large systems of practical importance. Another example is in the field of structural analysis. And here, a fundamental tool that we can use is Hooke's law. And suppose that we have a spring or some other structural element that has inherent stiffness k that we refer to as the spring constant. And suppose now we apply a load f to this spring, then the displacement x of the spring will satisfy a linear relationship, f is equal to kx, and this is Hooke's law. And this is usually valid over a certain range of loading sizes f. Now from this scalar equation, we can look at composite structures that have many components that are all connected together. And that will lead us to large matrix systems of the form capital Kx is equal to f. And so here, the matrix K is referred to as a stiffness matrix, and it encapsulates all of the connections and stiffnesses between the different components of our structure. And 
x is a displacement vector that tells us that all parts of our structure will deform, and f is a load vector that tells us about all of the loads that we're applying to different parts of our structure. And as an example, suppose we look at trying to predict the surface of a bridge under load. So this bridge could have a number of supports, and we could then want to predict how the bridge surface would deform. So we'd have here a stiffness matrix that would encapsulate all of the stiffnesses of the bridge surface. And we could apply a load from the bridge weight and also perhaps cars and trucks that are traveling on the bridge. And we could then predict how the bridge surface would deform. And this type of problem would really help us optimize our bridge design for a particular purpose. And there's commercial software available, such as SAP 2000, that can allow us to do this type of problem for very large structures, such as office blocks and skyscrapers. Another example is from the field of economics. And in 1973, Lontief was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for developing a linear input-output model for the production and consumption of goods. And suppose we look at an economy where n different types of goods are produced and consumed. Then we could introduce a matrix A, where an element Aij would represent the amount of good J required to produce one unit of good I. We could also introduce a vector x of the amounts of each type of good that are produced, and a vector d of the amounts of each type of good that are consumed. And in general, if we looked at our matrix A, then we would expect that the diagonal terms of this matrix will be zero, because we would not require a certain good in order to produce a unit of that good. So suppose we now look at the amount xi of good i that we need to produce. Then that will be equal to the inherent demand of good i plus the amount of that good that is required to produce all of the other goods that are in our economy. And we can write down, therefore, a linear relationship where we say that xi is equal to ai1 x1 plus ai2 x2 up to ain xn plus di. And if we look at that over all of the different i, it will lead us to a matrix system of the form x is equal to ax plus d. And we can reformulate that into i minus a applied to x is equal to d. And we could therefore solve that linear system to determine the amount of each good that we need to produce. And while you could look at some simple examples of this, you could imagine that for a large complex economy, we would have a very large matrix system that we need to solve. These three examples, taken from very different fields, highlight how matrix computations can emerge all over the place. And numerical linear algebra gives us a toolbox for solving these matrix systems in a stable and efficient manner. And nowadays, we're very fortunate that many numerical linear algebra algorithms are available to us in libraries in languages such as Python and MATLAB. And we can often use those library functions as black boxes without knowing exactly what they're doing. But it's often really useful for us to understand exactly how those library functions work. That can help us choose the right algorithm for a particular purpose. For example, suppose that our matrix has some special structure. Perhaps it's symmetric or perhaps it's banded then we might be able to use an algorithm that exploits that structure for better performance and stability. In addition, if we understand the different algorithms at work, then we can understand the different error properties of different algorithms, and that can help us select an algorithm that is valid for our particular application. So here, we're going to look at matrix problems of the form Ax equal b, and we're going to focus on square matrices A of size n by n. And if we look at a matrix problem, Ax equal b, then we can think of the matrix multiplication Ax as taking a linear combination of the columns of A with weights given by the components of x, xj. So specifically, if we write that b is equal to Ax, then we could write that as the sum from j equal 1 to n of xj multiplied by the jth column of A. And here, we make use of the notation that the jth column of A is written as A colon comma J, where the colon indicates that the row index can run over the entire range. This can be displayed schematically then 
as saying that the vector b is equal to the matrix A that we write in terms of its separate columns multiplied by our vector x. And we can write out that multiplication saying that we would then have x1 multiplied by the first column of A plus x2 multiplied by the second column of A up to xn multiplied by the nth column of A. And we can therefore interpret Ax equal b in terms of saying that x is the vector of coefficients of the linear expansion of b in terms of the basis of columns of A. And this is often a helpful point of view that's slightly different from the more conventional approach of thinking that every component of B is the dot product of a row of A multiplied by the vector x. And from this linear combination of columns viewpoint, we can immediately write down some facts. Firstly, we can see that the matrix problem Ax equal b will have a solution if b is contained in the vector space that is spanned by all of the columns of A. And we can write down some useful notation where we say that image of a matrix A is equal to that vector space spanned by A's columns. So now let's look a bit further at existence and uniqueness. So we can say a solution x will exist if b is contained in the image of a. And if a solution exists and the columns of a are linearly independent, then we know that the solution is unique. If a solution exists and there is a vector z that's non-zero, such that az is equal to zero, then we can deduce that a applied to x plus gamma z for any real gamma will also be a solution, and therefore we'll have infinitely many solutions. If b is not in the image of a, then a solution will not exist to x equal b. We can also introduce the idea of an inverse map, a inverse, and that will be well defined if and only if the linear system Ax equal b has a unique solution for all b. And from a different viewpoint, we can introduce a inverse matrix, A inverse, and that will satisfy that A multiplied by A inverse is equal to A inverse multiplied by A is equal to the identity. And that will exist if any of the following conditions are true. The determinant of A could be non-zero, the rank of A is equal to n, or that for any non-zero vector z, az is non-zero. And that essentially says that the null space of the matrix A is just equal to the zero vector. And we say that A is non-singular if A inverse exists. And if that is the case, then we can just solve our linear system by saying that x is equal to A inverse applied to B. If A inverse does not exist, then we say that A is singular.